Um, welcome back from lunch. Um, I was saying I was glad the sun had finally come out. So, uh, you know, it's the perfect time to come back inside <laughs> in, in the dark room, but you can at least see peaks of the sun out there. Um, we'll now begin our, our third panel of the conference. We have a number of fascinating multi-investigator um, projects to hear from right now, but let me first introduce my colleague, Julia Eliashar. Uh, Professor Eliashar is here in the Department of Anthropology at UC Irvine. Um, where she also sits on the Academic Advisory Board of the Institute for Money, Technology, and Financial Inclusion. She's an anthropologist of economy and markets who's done a lot of work also thinking about NGOs and finance and financialization, um, doing research in Cairo, Egypt, and in Slovenia, among other places. So without any further ado, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, everyone. So we don't lose much time. Let's just jump right in. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. The name of our panel uh, right now is Mobile Money's Agency in Everyday Behavior and Practices. Our first paper with the title of Evolving Participatory Relationships for Uplifting Urban Poor Rickshaw Pullers uh, will be presented by the, uh, Mani Nandi and Deepji Casey. I think only uh, Mani will be presenting. Yes, and they're... Uh, Mani is from the University of Delhi, and DP is from the Center for Microfinance at IFMR Research. Please. Yeah. So we'll continue as we were for the morning. There'll be 20 minutes of presentation. Thank you, Julia. Very good afternoon to all of you. It gives me great pleasure to be here presenting my third study. It has been an amazing experience for me uh, from my first study to today's study, which I, uh, with my co-researcher co Dipti from Center for Microfinance, we are working on the study. I would like to take you through the path we have traveled so far uh, in our efforts to back the unbanked rickshaw pullers in Delhi. Rickshaw pullers is a strong group of marginalized urban poor migrants and are bankable in terms of their saving potential as documented in an earlier IMTFI study. 95% depend on informal saving methods due to lack of KYC norms, which act as a barrier to banking them. Using an unorthodox route to bank these pullers through social activism, hand-holding support, and financial education it was aimed to use the Indian government's UID Aadhaar cards, which is a unique identification scheme expected to be a game changer in the financial inclusion scenario in, De in, Del in Del India. Research strategy was three-pronged. At the first level, social mobilization of pullers, obtaining them UID, uh, UID Aadhaar cards, and at the third level, to link them with mobile banking accounts. The sample area is an illegal slum settlement with many clusters of rickshaw pullers living in central Delhi. Our target population is drawn from two clusters of pullers from Madhya Pradesh. As we met the pullers during our field survey in the beginning of the phase, it became very clear to us that their willingness to participate depended on our demonstrating to them in actually getting them bank accounts and UID cards first. At the level of social mobilization stage, we sensed and faced utter disbelief, cynicism, distrust, and lack of enthusiasm for participating in the project by the rickshaw pullers. This stemmed from four critical reasons. One, earlier they were misled by some groups or organizations which promised to them to get a bank account and UID cards. Two, Puller's singular focus during the migratory period is to maximize their earnings. Three, they queried about the monetary and non-monetary costs in getting a bank account. Four, they confessed that their willingness to participate in this project is subject to our demonstrating to them in getting UID cards and bank accounts for some of them initially first. Puller's mindset raised questions in our minds and forced us to think about 
of a change of strategy towards our goal. Realizing we face a chicken first or egg first situation, we change the planned route from social mobilization to getting bank accounts first. Therefore, changing the strategy, we focused on getting the bank accounts first to overcome their reservations. To start with, six pullers with voters' ID of their states were mobilized and linked with the Eco State Bank of India's mobile banking saving account. This was done at an average time of five and six days for social mobilization and bank linkage, respectively. We then had to push the eco cart to get the accounts activated. At present, normal time is two weeks for account activation, but it took 61 days to activate these six accounts compared to the same day account activation time nearly one and a half years ago. Next, when the first puller attempted to deposit on the 59th day, his transaction failed due to a technical glitch. That is, his account had not migrated to the State Bank of India's core banking solution platform. Mobile banking account was chosen because of two reasons. It requires minimal KYC norms, and most pullers own a mobile phone. However, we experienced certain concerns at several steps. For instance, at the only State Bank of India eco-counter in the sampled area, lack of training and lack of pro-poor sensitivity of the CSP were revealing. Also, the CSP's primary focus was on the remittance product and not on the saving product. More revealing was at the BC level, where the puller's precious time was considerably spent on account opening day. This was because the CSP, who was two months old agent, was trained by the ECO officials on account opening formalities on the spot, on the same day at the ICICI ECO counter. ICICI is a private bank. Curiously enough, account-related SMS alerts were found to be in English. Server connectivity problems delayed receipt of the, of the messages about the first deposit made. Besides, handsets with one telecom operator were found to be receiving messages promptly. Last but not the least, Eco's back-end operations for the saving product was found to be weak due to its spotlight on remittance product, which has become a cash cow for the company. This is compounded by the State Bank of India's delays in verification of the KYC norms and synchronization of accounts with, the, with their CBS platform. Irritants and pain points at different levels in the State Bank of India eco-mobile banking rail reminded us of a football game. So we changed the track towards mobile banking the pullers through the private bank ICICI eco's uh, route because ICICI offers a KYC-free APNA savings account requiring a photo only and permits a maximum cash balance of INR 50,000. Eight pullers accounts were opened and activated immediately. First day, three pullers deposited $2 each. Subsequently, the pullers cart was pushed and we faced post delivery blues with a number of queries and doubts and the pullers were dithering to deposit. In terms of social mobilization of pullers, after opening mobile banking accounts, new faces approached, inclined to volunteer, and our social mobilization was like 
these ants gathering food particle by particle. We enlisted 75 pullers, finalized 30, and 45 pullers are waiting in the wings to participate, depending on our progress in UID and bank account opening. Going back to know what kind of post-purchase anxiety was exhibited by the pullers, some of the pullers' responses reflect their concerns. One, the BC counter is only a shop and does not resemble a, an impressive bank, and it's a poor cousin to the bank. Two, I have not heard about Eco, but I know about the branded bank. Three, bank does not charge for deposits and withdrawals, but why should the Eco shop charges if you are going to be saving there? Four, bank gives us ATM cards, but the Eco shop did not offer ATM facility. In the first week after opening mobile banking accounts, gently encouraging the pullers to deposit in the accounts, the pendulum seemed to swing towards the informal storing practices for various reasons. One, be it for current consumption needs or for meeting the ongoing festival expenses, pullers prefer to store money with the tekedar, who is a rickshaw contractor, or prefer to store money with themselves. Two, when money had to be sent home through a fellow villager, or to repay a sudden debt incurred due to gambling, a pastime in the pullers' slum settlement in Delhi, depositing in the account was far from their minds. <laughs> Lastly, and importantly, their focus in earning the whole day left them with no time to go that extra bit to the eco counter. Therefore, storing with the tekedar at their doorstep was stated to be convenient by them. Were there any elementary triggers that seem at the moment to tilt the scales towards on the spot pullers mobile bank with the tekedar? in the slum settlement, three ba basic triggers are visible. One, brand recognition about the bank is strong, but uncertainty about the BC or the sub-agent as against the time-tested tekedar was known to them. Two, eco-counter is not on their route to work as against the easily available services of tekedar at their place of stay. Three, Tekedar does not charge any transaction fees, while Eco Shop charges for transactions. While concerns are there, our experience has been like a, going on a merry-go-round so far in our journey. Getting the pullers UID enabled started with enrolling three pullers with a voter's ID of the state. However, for other homeless pullers, a prerequisite of getting an Aadhaar card was to get an introducer who will act as a guarantor. Not wanting to seek the help of any NGO acting as an introducer, I, as a principal investigator stationed in New Delhi, had to become an, had to become an introducer. By pushing the UID card from the top levels, I enrolled on 6 September, received the Aadhaar number on 15th October, then completed other formalities on 26 October, but the UID registrar from Central Delhi wanted a certificate from my employer, which I submitted on 9th November, but the UID introduced a status is unknown till today. Finally, we say thank you for your attention and end with the next three slides to let you know our unsaid thoughts in our efforts so far. Thank you so much, and I want to thank Bill, Jenny, and the rest of the IMTFI family.
Thank you. Bill, I just want to check something here. We'll move on to, they have, we have more time, so let's continue on. Okay, and then we'll take all the questions. I just, okay. Um, I just note that we have in a, a surfeit a little bit of time here that can, that is being kindly um, transferred a lot, you know, the minute transfers um, to the collective good of the panel. Um, so we have our next paper. We were told only 15 minutes, so be prepared okay, for Okay, but minutes. well, you'll get it for the questions and discussion. Okay. okay, so our next paper is called Making Sense of, can you hear me back there? Is it on? Okay. Making Sense of Mobile Money in Urban Ghana, Personal Business, Per, uh, excuse me, personal, business, social, and financial inclusion prospects. Um, and so our speaker will be uh, Vivian uh, Jukoto from Virginia Commonwealth University and Elizabeth Apia from Pentecost University College. Please. Welcome. Good afternoon. Um, I'll give you a minute to look at some of the um, interesting quotes that we collected as part of the qualitative part of the study. Um, these are thoughts that people had and responded to um, to our questions. Have you heard about mobile money? Have you used mobile money? What do you think about mobile money? And let me show you some of my favorites. So in the, up there you have, as for me, I prefer cash. That was a, a typical response. Then you had, um, I don't trust it. Um, I'll use it when others do. What if I lose my phone? You d we did have some users, so you have Life is Now Easy with Tigo Cash, which actually is a slogan from uh, Tigo at, at Telco. Um, everybody knows that we do not use it here. That was in a market. It's for rich people. Um, there is no way you can convince a Kweu woman not to use cash. Um, Kweu women um, dominate the market. And my personal favorite, it's 6660. And she declined to say anything further because she didn't want to go into a religious discussion, but she just thought that you know mobile money was demonic and didn't want to have anything to do with that at all. Okay. So um, what's the issue here? The issue is that mobile money uptake in Ghana has been relatively low since its introduction about three years ago. Um, it hasn't resembled Kenya at all, and so the question has been why. This, in a part, was a follow-up study in sorts um, to work that I did with Dr. Mensa last year, but we added some additional dimensions to our work. Oops, what did I do? And the research goals were to explore personal, business, social, and financial inclusion prospects of mobile money in Ghana. Um, we did a bunch of things. There's not gonna be enough time to talk about all of them. But um, first, what we're going to do is that um, Dr. P is going to tell you some results about a poll that we did, and then I'll come in and talk a little bit about some in-depth interviews that we did with people who had used mobile money before, and then some information from industries, and then we had some university students um, do spending diaries so that we could track what forms of money they use for their financial transactions. So I'll hand it over to Dr. Apia. Okay, as shown here, our sample size was about 1,250 persons. And we chose Accra as the main location with about 20 different sizes. So we interviewed a minimum of about 50 individuals at each site. That was minimum. Okay. And the questions that we asked were, have you ever used mobile money before? We also asked for age, gender, or sex, and then company use, which service provider did you use the mobile money for, and what they actually used the mobile money for. As you can see from the chat, only about 15% of the sample had used mobile money. Let's go. So now here we have okay, the mobile money uses. We have categorized by what they used it for. And you can see clearly from the chart that most of them use it for receiving money. And then 
transfer of money, or either both, used uh, receive money and transfer of money, and tiny proportion used it to pay water bills and so forth. On the right side here, we asked, have you ever used mobile money or which type of service provider did you use? Okay. And here we can see that the MTN has the largest market share, followed by Tigo and then Airtel. These are the major service providers in Ghana. And when we come to gender here, we realize that it's about gender balance in all the service providers. Okay, with the session of Airtel, where a significant proportion of male patronizes a service provider. Now, type use across networks, receive money was number one, as we said earlier on. So, where breaking it down by the service provider, you could see that almost all the service pro providers shown that receiving money was the key for the users. Okay, and the next followed by receiving money and then transfer money. Okay, and this is basically across all the service providers. Now we back to gender. The total sample is basically gender balanced here. When we break them down by non-users and users, it's about the same gender balance, almost 50-50, except with MCN, except with the non-users where the actual the male actually dominates slightly. Now when we break them down by age, you could tell that significant proportion of the age group between 25 and 40 actually use the mobile money, followed by 19 to I mean, 26 to 40 used it, and then 19 to 25. And basically, those who do not patronize at all are the 60 and plus, and under 18, 18 and below. Okay. So for instance, look at what uh, 60 plus will say. As for me, I am old, I like my cash, and dealing with what I know, maybe the young people will use it. So the young people have time to fiddle with their phones, and so far, they actually use the mobile money in Ghana currently. Okay. So let's, uh, Dr. Jokoto, to continue. So the, the data that um, Dr. Apia presented um, could be argued to be about early adopters. We had a sample of um, 1250, of which 15 percent had used mobile money at least once. And so the question is, what makes this 15 percent of people that we, we randomly found in our sample different from the other um, part of our sample that had not used mobile money? What made them tick? Were there any personality characteristics that sh you know, made it more likely for them to use mobile money? As a psychologist, I was interested in that. So what we did was that we conducted some in-depth interviews with 10 of um, mobile money users and asked them basically um, a whole bunch of questions to try and figure out whether it was their personality that made them you know, more likely to use mobile money or not. And it turns out that they were not actually more tech, technophilic, um, or, or what, whatever the word, word is, geeky, was what I was trying to avoid to use, than the average population. So it wasn't that they you know, went out of their way to have the latest mobile phone or whatnot. It was actually circumstance. Every single person said, I was in a bind, um, I needed to send some uh, money to somebody urgently, and I was advised by either somebody who had used it before or the bank or the phone company to use mobile money. So in none of these situations was mobile money something they just got up and said, oh, let me try it and see what happens. It was the situation that drove them to um, actually use mobile money. So I thought that was uh, very important. Okay, so that's from the consumer side. We tried in the study to get some information from from industry, 
and um, we weren't able to get a lot and all of them swore me to secrecy. And so we had to anonymize, anonymize and transform the data because the different companies are very protective of their data and nobody wanted anybody to know what their numbers were. So what we have here is the logs of the data that we actually got, not at all representative of all the transaction frequencies in Ghana over time, but we do have some from a variety of sources that I can't tell you. Um, but as you can see, they, you know, all the different companies and partners and stakeholders involved have argued over time that mobile money in Ghana needs time to grow, mobile money is increasing, and this graph kind of suggests that it is, but we're gonna run some analysis later and try and figure out whether these slopes are actually that statistically significant or not. Okay. In addition to that, we conducted interviews with um, members of industry, and thematic analysis of the interviews um, gave rise to a bunch of themes which I'll go over quickly. The first um, barrier, I guess, to mobile money uptake that was uh, mentioned by people in the industry was the current limited utility of mobile money in the sense that a lot of people, as you can see, um, it's, used for mobile, uh, it's used for money transfer, but apart from that, a few bill pays, um, insurance, airtime, and... Um, opportunities with second cycle institutions, there's not that much that people can currently use mobile money for. There have been discussions about having, um, making connections to ATMs, that's not happened yet. Um, even, pay, even employees of the telcos themselves do not use mobile money. Um, so that tells you, you know, something. Um, until, and so there's one company that actually said they made their employees enroll for mobile money. Um, and then you also had, I also talked to two programmers who um, designed software to operate on mobile money platforms, and they talked a lot about the um, stonewalling that they received, basically um, in their attempts to try and create other uses for mobile money. There was no enthusiasm from the industry to capitalize on these things, as well as from retailers. I also talked to churches um, to ask whether they could see mobile money being used in church donations in terms of church offertory and, and tithings. And in every single case, I got a very strange look, like, what are you talking about? Why would you want to you know, give offertory on a mobile phone? We need, the, we need the physicality of cash to include in the ritual, so it's not gonna happen. So as one of my, my um, interviewees said, that in order for there to be increased uptake, Ghana will have to build an entire mobile money payment ecosystem before um, uptake can increase. Another problem that was listed was agents, in the sense that agents who were involved in mobile money have consistently argued that their profit margins are too low, and a lot of them actually said that it was much more profitable to sell bagged water than it was to be involved in the mobile money enterprise. So why on earth would they waste their time if they cannot make a profit? So one of the issues is that that affects pricing. If, if they increase the price, then people won't patronize it. And so that's been a barrier. But from the consumer perspective, we also found an absence of agents. There would be signs advertised, but the agents would have gone home, not come to work, not have any cash. And there were a lot of places where agents were supposed to be, but were not there anymore. So you have a lot of agents that have discontinued their services, which prevents, you know, decreases the likelihood of people actually trying to use mobile money. There was also noted an information gap, and I think the most interesting um, quote that I came across was that on two separate occasions, a regional director sent the Bureau of National Investigation to go and arrest people from a company that had allowed people to pay their electricity bills with mobile money. And this was because of an information gap because you are actually supposed to, and the, the telco companies have created platforms for electricity bills to be paid with mobile money, but there were some officials who thought that this was a scam. And so there was a lot of miscommunication, and we still found a general low level of public awareness of mobile money, even though it was slightly higher than research that were done the year before. 
um, people from the industry also thought that illiteracy was still a barrier to mobile money uptake. Another barrier which I think um, may or may not be unique to Ghana but has some implications to why Ghana's uptake is not working as well as Kenya's is, is that um, there are some regulatory issues. And so in Ghana, the telcos have to partner with banks, cannot um, operate individually, and the partnership still needs to work out a lot of kinks. So there was the perception, for example, that um, the banks were not necessarily as invested in the initiative as the telcos were, and so then there needs to be um, some improvement in that relationship and a better uh, definition of what the different um, responsibilities are in terms of marketing, in terms of investment, in terms of the different roles that people play. One thing that was pointed out was the perception from the banking sector that to date, mobile money in Ghana actually is not a conduit for financial inclusion for now, at least not in urban Ghana South, because it is actually, the, it is being patronized by the banked. Now the banked may be sending, using it to send money to the unbanked in different parts of the country, so in that way it is, fi it is providing um, financial access, but the perception was that in, in urban Ghana, in urban Accra at least, the um, people involved with um, mobile money were very likely to already have multiple bank accounts. There is also um, competition between the mobile money companies. There's a lot of employee poaching going on, a lot of turnover and reorganization of mobile money departments, and there have also been allegations of sabotaging, and um, which you know people kind of allege to without, with or without um, substantiation. But there was one major concern, and the quote goes, you have all these things sitting in silos, trying to do different things with a common objective because there is no national agenda, so it is all over the place. And the point here was that the telcos will need to kind of streamline their um, activities and realize that even though they're competitors, they are all in this together. Um, but there seemed to be a unanimous um, belief that there was pot potential for growth. So I got a lot of statements like, we will get there, the building blocks are there, it will work. I believe strongly that it will work. Um, but a recognition of needing to build trust and a lot of telcos saying that they had plans in place, um, new marketing strategies which they were not at liberty to discuss at that point. So the question for mobile money in Ghana now is this. It, it's sort of a chicken and egg question. It's a case of if we build it, will they come versus if they need it, will they use it? And I think the answer is that time will tell. But right now, here are some of the things that are going on in Ghana. So Airtel, for example, has 540,000 transactions daily you have 13% of Tigo subscribers doing five to six mobile money transactions a month. Tigo cash float is $11 million daily, which is about $5.5 million. That's their daily cash float. MTN um, reports 1.5 million transactions monthly to the value of 52 million um, Ghana cities, which is about $26 million. Um, the Airtel money cash float on a daily basis is four million Ghana cities, which is um, two million dollars. And you have 156,000 active Tigo cash subscribers. So there are people using mobile money. It's just a question of how many and, and is this going to continue and is this going to grow? But at the same time, Ghanaians primarily still use cash. So in the spending diary that we did, we found that 157 students made 1,222 cash-based transactions and only 2.86% of their transactions were non-cash. So as you can see, 97% of transactions in this small sample was cash-based. Ghana is still today a very much cash-based economy. So time will tell whether mobile money um, uptake will improve or not. And um, 
Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks to IMTFI for sponsoring the study. And I also want to say thank you to my research assistants who helped with the field work. So our third paper, and then we will go on to questions and discussion. Uh, the third paper, the title is Delivering Cash Grants to Indigenous Peoples Through ATM and GCash Remit. Um, I will, and this will be offered, uh, the, both, will both authors come up? Yeah, uh, Anatoly Gusto, Mikra, is that the correct? Yeah, Mikra of Philippines, and Emily Roque, uh, Ateneo de Manila University. Please, welcome. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Um, before I start, I'd like to thank uh, IMTFI for supporting our research. This is actually my second year here. Uh, we're, we're very excited, maybe tense a bit, to, to do our presentation and share with you our uh, initial research findings and analysis on the IPs or the indigenous people who are, uh, incidentally, the beneficiaries of uh, cash, um, conditional cash uh, grant transfer in the Philippines. So um, doing this work, we're actually also excited because we thought that it tackles four main points or four key points for us. And um, this include indigen indigenous people, or I, I, I'll refer to as IPs, ATM, or automated teller machine, financial technology, and lastly, money or cash. So all these four key points more or less echo uh, some research questions that we've arrived at. And these are, um, how do IPs perceive and respond to using cash? And how do they respond to you using financial technology? What are the possible changes in perceptions and behavior towards money and technology? And how do they spend, save, and utilize the cash grants given to them? Um, so before anything else, I'd like to qualify that the research is not about assessing or looking at the effectiveness of the program, the cash grant program um, overall, but it's really more of a deep dive into the technology side, into the delivery channel side, whether it is somehow um, a hindering or a facilitating factor for the target beneficiaries. And so that, that's entirely the focus. Uh, our presentation is divided as follows. I'll be giving you quickly a quick background uh, on, on CCT in general. Then Emily, my colleague, will proceed with uh, details on the program in the Philippines. Uh, she will also discuss uh, about the findings in, in the research. Then I will continue the discussion with the quick uh, points on the conclusion as well as the takeaway lessons for us. So now going to the background, um, for those of you who are not familiar with CCT or conditional cash transfer, this, it's a social or a government program which provides subsidy to say, quote unquote, the poorest of the poor in, in, in a country and in the form of cash, not in the form of kind as uh, probably experienced in, in some countries. Uh, but this is conditional, this is contingent and contingent on certain uh, requirements or behavior of the target beneficiary. And in most cases, it's about um, sending children to school or bringing them to health centers. And obviously, as you can see, the end beneficiary here really is uh, the children as end recipients. Now, in the Philippines, what we call the CCT program is uh, four Ps. Four Ps stands for um, Pantawid Pamilyang Pilipino Program. So uh, that's, the reason why, uh, that's the reason why it's called four Ps, for the four P letters. Uh, it's, uh, it's spearheaded by DSWD, or Department of Social Welfare and Development, uh, as well as uh, the Land Bank of the Philippines as the financial uh, uh, agency in charge with the disbursement. So um, one interesting factor about the Philippine case is that one of the target segments is uh, on the marginalized ethnic groups or indigenous people. And in terms of channel or delivery channel, we saw that uh, it's a mix of both traditional or over-the-counter release of, of cash, as well as technology-driven uh, ATM, and as well as mobile money like GCash. 
So now I'd like to turn the floor to, to Emily for the program details. Hi, thank, thank you, Jing. Um, hello, everyone. Okay, pleasant afternoon. So um, I'd just like to give you an overview of how... Um, sorry, how does this go? Okay, I think I turned it off. Okay, sorry. Okay, so um, this is a slide from the DSWD um, um, PowerPoint, okay, and uh, it talks about the program conditionalities, okay? So how, does, how much does a beneficiary get every month or at least every two months, okay? Um, so they have two aspects, the education factor and the health factor, okay? So um, in order to avail the cash grant, the program has several conditions. Um, for education, if you're a parent, you have to make sure that your children have an 85% rate of um, attending classes. Uh, if, they, if they do, they get 300 pesos or around $7 per child. Okay? So if you have three children, which is the maximum per household, um, you can get a maximum of 900 pesos per month or $21 or so. Okay? So that's the education aspect. Um, but if your child or, or children do not have a rate of 85% in attending classes, for example, they have only 50% or even 1% of attending classes, or they do not attend classes frequently, um, uh, the beneficiary or the household do not get anything in the education side. Okay, so we go to the health aspect. Um, for health, each household has to complete five requirements. So the, mother, the, fir the first is that the mother has to get a pre- or postnatal checkup. The second is that the children aged 0 to 2 have to be vaccinated. The third is that the children aged 3 to 5 have to visit the Brangay Health Center or the BHS, basically the Community Health Center. Um, and then the parents have to attend a family development session or an FDS. And the children need to be dewormed. Okay? So um, the SWD has an all or nothing clause which means that if, you, if uh, the beneficiary do not fulfill uh, any of these requirements, they do not get anything. But if they do complete all these requirements, they get 500 pesos or uh, $12 per household. Okay? Um, so the maximum amount that the household gets is 1,400 per month or uh, $35 a month around that um, uh, money, but in reality, the program gives out cash grants every two months. So it's supposed to be every month, but uh, the SWD has set it up for every two months. Okay, so beneficiaries get a maximum of two thousand eight hundred pesos, or around seventy dollars every two months. Okay. Okay. So as uh, Jing discussed earlier, the actors that um, for the CCT or the Four Piece program. Or, um, uh, the, the, the DSWD or the Department of Social Welfare and Development. So they're the implementing government agency uh, for the four P's. And then we have the land bank. Um, it's also a government bank, a state bank, and they handle all the disburse, disbursements of the cash grants. Okay, and of course, we have the beneficiaries, which are mostly women, and for this study, belong to indigenous groups. Okay, so from here on, er, er, well, I've been referring to... Uh, uh, social Welfare and Development as DSWD and then Land Bank and Beneficiaries as IPs, okay? Right, as, um, this is the actual process of disbursement. So this is what happens on the ground. Um, it's kind of like the sub-actors, okay? So this, uh, so it starts with the DSWD's national office uh, coordinating with the regional office down here, okay? And then the regional office will coordinate with the municipal link or the ML. Uh, he, uh, the ML is the assigned person or the staff per municipality. And then the ML or the municipal link coordinates with the PL or the parent leaders who handle or are directly in contact with the beneficiaries. Okay, so uh, the parent leaders will inform beneficiaries when and where the pay, payout will be. So um, uh, beneficiaries are divided into two kinds of payouts. Uh, the over-the-counter... OTC, and um, ATM. Uh, and this is mainly the recurring theme of our study. So um, basically, um, our research objective is really to compare um, the, the experiences of IP beneficiaries according to the type of delivery mechanism and disbursement. 
uh, okay, so we have two, the OTC and the ATM. Uh, for the OTC, it's mostly applicable in hard-to-reach areas, especially in municipalities with no banks. So um, uh, it's now Philpos who, uh, who handles the disbursements in specific areas, especially in the far-flung areas. But before, it used to be Gcash. Um, it's where the cash grants are sent through mobile phones. Um, but um, we face, again, the problem of, uh, of the inavailability of network signals. So, um, and also Gcash has higher transaction costs than Philpost, so this WD shifted to Philpost. And um, for the ATM, uh, it's only applicable in the lowlands where banks and ATMs are present. Uh, beneficiaries get an el electronic cash card. So they have a card, but it's really a cash card, which means that they can withdraw, but they cannot deposit. They cannot deposit anything for, in it. And uh, it cannot be used for payment for goods and services. Okay, so um, the institutions for this are land bank. And sometimes it's the first consolidated bank when there's no land bank in the area or in the municipality. Okay, so for the method, uh, so we did a survey of 60 beneficiaries, so 30 per type of disbursement, so 30 for uh, ATM, 30 for OTC. Um, we also conducted FGDs uh, with both males and females. So um, it's the wives who are the beneficiaries, but we also talk uh, with their husbands. Uh, we did this because it's also interesting what the males think about the CCT program, which are really more focused on women and children. Okay. Um, and also we had key informant interviews with the DWD staff, the land bank officials, and so on. Okay, for our research site, uh, it's a uh, research site is basically in Palawan in southern Philippines um, because uh, the mode of payment is dependent on the situation of the area like whether there's a bank or not in the municipality uh, it actually led us to interview two groups of IPs so actually we have um, two groups the lowlands and the upland IPs um, the lowland IPs are in um, Brooks Point and have both ATM and OTC and um, the upland IPs who are uh, living in Rizal and have OTC as the mode of disbursement. Okay. So basically, the profile of our respondents are so mostly uh, female, um, and then their uh, the average age is 36 years old. Majority had no schooling, um, and the mode of transportation to collect or get the CCT money is um, in Brooks Point or in the lowland. It's a tricycle or motorcycle. Uh, and uh, in Rizal, in the upland, it's mostly by foot. Okay, so we go to the findings. Um, we, ha we had a lot of findings, but we had to um, um, get only the, well, the most interesting points for us. Okay, so here's the summary table of the experiences of IPs. Okay, um, uh, above this, you can see uh, videos or moving images of how the areas look like. Okay, so for uh, the Brooks Point is in the low, lowlands and Rizal is in the upland, okay? And um, actually, we had um, two modes of payment, right? In Brooks Point, so it's ATM and OTC, and Rizal is OTC, okay? So um, because the sites in Brooks Point are near the main town, it takes them one hour. It takes the beneficiaries one hour. Um, but in Rizal, it takes them three hours to get to the uh, payout venue. Uh, the mode of transportation for the two sites, it's um, mostly tricycle and motorcycle. But in um, Rizal, it's 93% um, go by foot. And uh, surprisingly, 7% um, have a motorcycle and some um, ride in the truck. But we'll discuss it later. Okay. So the average transportation cost, um, in Brooks, it's 85 pesos or around $2. Is it $2? Okay. And then um, 50 pesos or around $1. But in uh, Rizal, um, when they ride the truck, uh, they, uh, they have to pay um, 300 pesos or um, around $7. Uh, and some complaints or issues of the um, beneficiaries is that, for, for instance, in Brooks, in, especially in the ATM type of disbursement, um, there's a long line. Uh, they are exposed to heat and rain because there's no shade in the area. Uh, it takes a whole day for most of them. Sometimes um, they're already there at 7 a.m., sometimes at 3 a.m. 
Um, and um, the line finishes at 3 p.m. Or sometimes if the ATM malfunctioned, uh, they go home at 10 p.m. Okay. Uh, in Brooks Point, the OTC experience there is that um, uh, they have faster lines due to uh, the DSW staff checking GANs manually, um, and the venue is shared in the roof, and it takes only three to five hours. But in Rizal, it's very different. Um, uh, the complaint of the beneficiary, beneficiaries is that it's very far from the community. It takes a whole day. Um, delays happen to staff delivering GANs due to weather. Because the uh, Philippo staff, they have to go up the mountains in order to deliver the actual cash gets. Okay. So another interesting point that we found is that um, in the ATM in Brooks, the, the ATM machine in Brooks Point, there's a sign that says um, announcement: dispensing 500 peso, uh, 500 and 1,000 peso bills only. Okay. Okay. Um, um, okay, so um, um, the maximum is 2,800, for example. It's 2,800. And the ATM will only dispense 2,500, so 1,000, 1,500. Um, and this is some, you have something left, it's 300. Um, but the, the beneficiary can only get it um, when, um, um, when the next cash grant has leftovers again, amounting to 500, 1,000, 1,500, and so on. Um, in a way, they are saving and attesting to feeling happy when they get a bigger amount in the next payout. So in a sense, they have a, uh, they have a, uh, already, a, they stumbled upon a savings experience already. Okay, so, uh, okay, okay. So um, there are also challenges, okay? Um, I'll just select this so we can go to the conclusion. Okay, so beneficiaries don't know actually how to perform the ATM transactions. Okay, only parent leaders were taught and um, they're very much afraid to use um, the card because um, it might be captured by the ATM and they can't get the cash card anymore. Okay, and then another interesting note is that uh, especially in the uplands, OTC has several challenges. They do not easily trust outsiders and programs. So there are rumors that, for example, at the end, the CCD program is not a real program. Others said that if you join, this WD will put tattoos in our organs. Okay, so there are rumors like that going around. Okay, so it's not easy to trust. And then changes in the cash flow. Um, Rizal, um, they bar uh, in, in the upland, okay. Uh, originally they barter, and later on, um, when the CCT, ca CCT, CCT comes in, okay, um, and when um, you have no, they have no more cash, they go back to barter. Um, but in Brooks Point, um, they have cash, and then this, uh, the cash comes in, uh, CCT cash comes in, and when they don't have cash anymore, they engage in credit. Okay, um, maybe we should go to the, yeah. Okay, um, in the interest of time, maybe uh, we can, I guess we can just share the PowerPoint presentation, but um, anyway, for the conclusion and recommendation, just quickly, we have general uh, conclusion points and then specific points. So on the first point, we, we saw that the CCT introduced the concept of money to some IP beneficiaries, particularly on the upland, who are more familiar with the uh, in-kind transactions. Uh, number two, there is evidence of change in the way they perform their financial transactions, as uh, Emily described a while ago, from barter to cash and then from cash to credit. The number three um, and four, uh, obviously CCT is about spending or consumption. And on the first part, on the positive part, we saw households actually spending the money for the intended purpose or intended use, which is about education and about health. But on the negative side, there's some sort of leakage, for lack of a better term. A leakage uh, because of three more or less factors. Fungibility, because cash obviously can be spent on other items besides health and uh, education-related uh, expenses. Liquidity, because sometimes, as, as you saw in the ATM, machine, um, li there is limited number of uh, bills available to them, whether it's 100 or it's uh, 500 bills. And sometimes merchants find it hard to um, um, exchange uh, or give exact change. And that, that's also related to divisibility. And then, um, as you can also imagine, um, for them, cash is not as important as we probably consider as we put cash in, uh, in a vault, they put cash in just a plastic bag. It's really more of a medium of exchange and not really more of a store of value. Saving cash for other purposes or other needs is still very uncommon. 
And then for conclusion recommendation, just quickly on the following. We see that um, access to cash cards has not translated to formal savings, but there is a good sign that it can lead into that. Um, alternative delivery mechanisms might function better if beneficiaries are taught on how to use them. Uh, on CCT programs being transformative, direct direction should be shifted from being spending focused to maybe spending and savings focused. And uh, partners which can provide complementary financial services should be tapped. Uh, lessons learned, understand and respect user context. Beneficiaries should be considered maybe a we instead of an I. Apply and use delivery mechanisms that are simple, accessible, and easy to use. Uh, identify not only the, the client, but also the influencer who can connect and educate the user uh, or the beneficiary. And lastly, we, if, if we consider what, um, what CCT is, uh, I think in terms of uh, introducing innovation, it should be like uh, learning to dance or even dancing Gangnam style, wherein people can easily perform it, People, people can easily learn it. So with that, thank you very much. Um, so we have um, a good um, 35 minutes for, for discussion. I'm going to intervene in a way I wasn't supposed to, and since we had an extra five minutes from the first panel, I'm going to ask a question, which I'm not really supposed to do, but I'm going to do it anyway. So, because um, there was a little bit of time. So maybe uh, there was one point I wanted to ask you to expand on a little bit, and then we're going to have, like we had in the previous sessions, if you have a question, please raise your hand, and, um, and the mic will come to you. So the first question I had um, on the first, well, the one question I'll raise here. Um, one, I was interested to hear a little bit more about um, social activism, social mobilization, and what that meant to you in this context, um, because that's something that you don't raise, and I was wondering whether the methodology was like action research, or what the getting involved in the, um, the networks meant, and, what, and, and, and how this was social activism, and how that um, related to some of the cost issues as well that you were dealing with, with some of the, um, the people that you were working with, of the relative costs of different, um, different programs. So you can, you don't have to answer, just I'm giving you a, just, I don't think uh, answer. So uh, first I'll share my experience of social mobilization and probably Manny can also share her experience for me. Uh, so uh, when we first went to uh, our, uh, the, the study area, uh, we went there and we started talking about the uh, the benefits of uh, having bank accounts. We started with why they don't have bank accounts, everything. So we had to keep telling them about uh, uh, mobile money uh, and uh, benefits of uh, opening bank accounts, savings. And again, going back to them, talking about the same thing, encouraging them to uh, uh, open bank accounts. So we were uh, looking at the behavioral aspect, like uh, to what level uh, this intervention is needed for them to go to uh, bank uh, account or to open bank accounts. Uh, so for us, uh, at least what I understood from my experience, mobilization was to uh, continuously involving them in the process, talking about the, uh, talking about the benefit, understanding why uh, they are not ready uh, for for like whatever product uh, we were talking about, and also trying to overcome uh, you know, any constraint uh, from their point as well as from service provider point. So uh, that is what my experience as a social mobilist, and Manny, you can also share. So, uh, let me, uh, the context is, uh, it is more action research. And um, rickshaw pullers are a very large group. You know, estimated numbers are uh, six lakhs, uh, that is 600,000 people to 900,000 pullers in Delhi alone. Now, uh, so when we chose a sample area, it was an illegal uh, slum settlement. There are about 2,000 to 3,000 pullers, where there are a large number of clusters of pullers from different states or communities. Uh, who uh, take uh, high rickshaws from different contractors. Now, how do we start? And um, to mobilize them, 
uh, social mobilization meant uh, our sample size was 50 pullers. But how do we get the 50 pullers? So when we started off in the slum cluster, we started with one set of people we introduced. And so it was essentially to get to know them, uh, tell them about why we have come, what is our intention, and how we would like to uh, have handholding support, and then enlist them. So in the action research, enlisting them and identifying the, uh, the target uh, number of pullers was social mobilization as such for us. Is that? Yes. Fine. So um, now can we go on? We'll, uh, should we get like three questions and then you can say who it's directed to? Yes, please. Okay. Yeah, and please identify yourselves before you uh, sure. ask the question. Hi, I, I'm Jenna Burrell. I'm with the School of Information at UC Berkeley. And I have a question for the team who studied mobile money transfer in Ghana. Um, but first a comment. I think it's, it's really unusual and always exciting to me to see people look at sort of disinterest and non-use of technology. And um, I'd like to see more of that in the world. So um, thanks for a really interesting um, body of work uh, trying to explain the disinterest in mobile money in Ghana. Um, I've also spent quite a bit of time in Ghana myself and have studied market women and have similarly found what you found about um, lack of the use of these services. And so my, my question or my comment is about um, whether you've started to think about looking at um, M-Pesa as a comparison, because there's actually a lot of work on the success of M-Pesa that I, that I think might help you unravel the non-success of money transfer in Ghana. Um, and in particular, a lot of work by Olga Morishinsky. Um, so, you know, there are a couple of things that I, I um, heard you talking about. Some mentioned that, that perhaps the lack of different services was the reason why p mobile money wasn't popular. I, I think in the case of M-Pesa, it wasn't necessary to have a whole array of services to make that a successful um, service. Just simply moving money from A to B was, um, was key. Um, also, I'm wondering if you've thought about patterns of urban to rural remittances. Um, and whether there's maybe a difference in kind of the urbanization of Ghana compared to urbanization in Kenya, and maybe there's an explanation there. Um, and then another explanation I've heard for uh, the success of M-Pesa in Kenya, this is the last thing I'm going to say, um, is that uh, part of it had to do with um, brand trustworthiness of Safaricom and the fact that that service was really pushed by a single provider that invested a lot of energy into it and spreading it out into rural areas. Um, I think what we're going to do before we go right to answers is we'll get two or three questions out and then, um, and then we'll have the answers. Yes, please. Is the mic on? Are you going to circle? Okay. Yeah. Hello. I'm Eduardo from Brazil. I'd like to make a question for the Ghana case. Uh, first of all, it was very interesting. All the three cases that were presented was really nice. Uh, my question is, is it's, I don't know if I missed something, but I could see clearly uh, the point of view of the users, uh, uh, the, the, the mobile operators, uh, banks, but I, I couldn't clearly see what is the point of view of the central bank or the regulator uh, responsible for that. So I'd like to see, uh, to hear from you, What's the, what, do, what, what do you think or what's the point of view of the regulator? What do they think about that? What, are they moving to do something to, to change the situation? Okay. We're going to take just one more question um, until we move on. So, yeah, thanks, you guys. Thank you. Hi, Gustav Peebles, uh, The New School. I had a very simple question uh, because I, I have a topic that I think is, um, that I'm interested in is Connectivity. So, if we think of the of the transfer of the money, mobile money, <clears throat> as no different than say highways and cars and buses and what have you, a highway can either be a toll highway that's built by a private company and uh, individuals pay to get on it, or it can be subsidized by the government. So, my question is um, for Emily and Anatoly. I was just curious for the seven dollar transfer or the or the twelve dollar transfer. Is that the exact amount of money that the end user receives, or is the toll for transferring the money something that they pay or that the state subsidizes? Okay, these are great, great questions. So why don't we um, why don't we move down the table, y'all, and then you can start, yeah, and then we'll move this way. Sorry, I thought we were doing this. Yeah, no, yeah. never mind. Sorry. 
All right, so the first question was about um, differences between Ghana and PESA. Um, I've, we've thought about it a lot. Um, I and Dr. Mesa have, have thought about it a lot. But the, the problem is that there are just too many differences, and so it's not an easy comparison. One of the major differences between Ghana and Kenya is the, regul the regulatory restrictions. And so because you have, the, you have two different countries, somewhat similar histories, um, but there are so many differences that the comparison just isn't fair. Ghana is not exactly the, the same as Kenya. You have um, Safaricom starting without having to partner with banks, and in, in Ghana you have these partnerships which have really shaped the direction in which mobile money has been um, marketed and adopted and, and thought of as an option. And so that's one difference. CGAP did a study looking at the um, urban to rural um, transmissions and that even though there was previous assumptions that most of the remittances to Ghana were from um, outside the country to inside the country, the CGAP study actually indicated that that may not necessarily be the only source of remittances. So it's not clear at this point whether um, the Ghanaian remittance direction is, is, most, is more towards you know, from outside in, but there's, there is enough um, room within um, the country itself for, for city to city or city to village um, remittances um, to make it similar to Kenya. Um, the second question, oh, and then the other thing about brand trust, um, that's a tricky one. I mean, all the telco companies have loyal customers, even though most people own more than one um, SIM card uh, because you know everybody needs a backup in case one doesn't work and, and all that. But most people do seem to trust the telcos, and so I don't think that would be an issue as to why they wouldn't trust the brand. It's more of an issue of not trusting cashlessness yet, is what I think it is. Um, to the second question about the central bank, I did interview one person from the central bank who seemed to have a relatively positive um, perception of the future of mobile money, but also recognition of the fact that there were a lot of obstacles, which included um, fine-tuning the partnerships with the um, banks and the telcos. And also, you actually have, there was discussion about the possibility of the telcos themselves creating financial institutions in order to kind of get around the regulatory restriction. Because the idea is that if you have an independent bank and a telco company trying to partner with something, if the bank is not that invested in it, it may not work as well. But if the telco creates a financial institution for the sole purposes of managing this relationship, then clearly you'd have a better working relationship. So there's some discussion about, okay, here are the rules, but this could be a, a legal way to navigate the problems with the, the mandated banking partnerships at the moment. And so the, the regulatory body is aware of the problems, but there are reasons why these rules were put in place. And so I don't think that they're considering changing the rules, even though the telco companies would be completely thrilled if the rules were changed. You guys want to go Okay. So, um Correct me if I'm wrong, but our, our understanding is if you're asking about whether the amount that we mentioned is the exact amount that is uh, received by the beneficiary, is that right? Yeah, I mean, who pays yeah. Money yeah. Um, actually, the answer there would be a yes and a no. Um, a yes because on face value, they get it, the, the amount as stated, but the problem is uh, the leak or the leakage that's happening somewhere around, uh, along the way. I mean, um, transportation going to the payout site is not uh, shouldered by the government or by the municipal government. Um, as, as we said, if it's in an ATM, it, it cannot be withdrawn entirely if it's not divisible by 500 or 1,000 bills. And so there, there's like a delay of, of the portion of the money that is intended for the target beneficiary. Thank you. Okay, so uh, next questions. Let's get another round. Do we have the mic? Hands up can we, so we can see who else will. Okay, go ahead and then, okay. Two, do we have a third? All right. This is uh, for Mani and Deepti uh, on your research on cycle rickshaw pullers. So you mentioned uh, tying the unique ID, the UID project to the accounts and the money transfer. I know there's been a lot of concern in India about the uh, privacy 
considerations to do with UID and you also mentioned that you were working with what could be considered a vulnerable population, especially since they live in a illegal uh, settlement as you mentioned. So I was wondering if you have been thinking about uh, future privacy concerns about how if they do manage to get UID cards, how that could possibly have some repercussions for their living in a illegitimate settlement or in any other way? Thanks, um, Janaki. This is, uh, we are work, working with migrants uh, from different states, especially from Madhya Pradesh, the slum cl cluster we are working with. The idea of getting them a UID card is only because they do not have any proper KYC norm documentation, which is essential for getting them a bank account. Now, if you are to get them a bank account, they need this identification. Now, the only way, uh, for these homeless pullers is through the UID route. If they get the Aadhaar cards, that uh, enables them to get a, uh, they become eligible to get a bank account. Not that it actually happens on the ground, because the RBI's proactive policy on financial inclusion is there. But how each bank interprets on the ground is very different. Some of the banks do accept it. It's not mandatory that UID has to be accepted as a KYC one, but there has been a, a push by the government to ensure that this is going to be used. So uh, that, that is the reason we use this one. We do not think about the privacy considerations. It's only as an identification document. Right, but I was, I was wondering if you think in the future that it might have some repercussions. I understand why you used it, but I'm just wondering, do you feel like it might have some repercussions in the future that you would need to plan around? Or? Uh, plus, uh, our it's a voluntary, you know, the way uh, the respondents who come with us to open UID, we, are, we tell them about uh, what unique identification uh, this card is. So till now, I mean, to be very honest, we haven't thought about that. And it's voluntary. Like we tell them, they come, they, if they need ID card, they take it. Um, we don't force them. So actually, we haven't thought about it. It's the first time actually we're having May I add one, also want to this? Um, many of the pullers want a UID yeah. other card because they do not have a identification card. So when they can get it and, and enables them to get a bank account, they willingly accept it. So we have uh, two more questions now. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, uh, I have to ask uh, the last presenter. See, the model which you have uh, you introduced, I mean, I just want to know when it was introduced in your country, and uh, before introduction and after introduction, what change in terms of penetration uh, you found? I mean, is it positive or negative, one? Second, uh, and you said that education and health is the criteria to pass on subsidy in form of cash to the bank of these people. But is it, uh, I mean, there is no criteria of identifying these people with respect to income. I mean, they are just doing, the, uh, passing this subsidy to everybody in that country? Or is it something they're targeting uh, uh, some particular section of the society? One. And second, if it is targeting certain section of the society, uh, then my another question is, that you said education and children, but there are some, you know, some poor people are there, and uh, they are not. Uh, I mean, they don't have children of edu I mean, of that age group, and uh, there is no, you know, uh, no um, particular compulsion with respect to education because everybody have surpassed all that uh, at that particular. I mean, that particular stage. Then, to whom they are passing on that subsidy, you know, and uh, because in India the same model they are planning to. Uh, apply, uh, but targeting on the poor uh, because to stop the middleman leakages, which is happening with respect to subsidies. But now, I mean, though it has your model also have leakages with respect to ATM is not uh, providing the amount, uh, full amount to them. Uh, but another thing, I just, the third part of this, uh, uh, you know, I want to uh, know from you because it's very interesting that 200 rupees, if the amount is 2,200 rupees and the person can receive only, can and cash only 2,000 uh, 2, rupees, then 
were, I mean, are they providing some interest on this 200 rupees? Because it's something, money is something which is very time bound. It is very contextual. So it is lying with them unused. So they, sh they are they providing interest or not? So these are the three questions. If you don't mind holding, we'll get one more question on. Yeah. We have a question right here. I'll, I, while you're walking around, I'll do ask another brief question here, um, which has to do with the paper from the Philippines. Again, what is, who defines um, an indigenous person? And then, okay. Sh please. Should I ask before Go the ahead, answer? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I agree with the Ghanaian uh, team that uh, the differences between Kenya and Ghana are too big, uh, too big differences. And therefore, comparisons becomes a problem. But even inside Kenya, we have other problems. Uh, although M-Pesa has been very successful, other mobile money services have not been very successful, uh, particularly mobile banking. Uh, all the products that have been introduced in the market have refused or have been incapable of scaling. That's a big problem. We have the example of M-Pesa in-house, but we still can't get other mobile money products uh, working. Uh, so I, I really sympathize anybody who tries to, to learn anything from Kenya because we can't even learn it from ourselves. Uh, but when I look at this um, uh, mobile banking business, uh, I feel that, I, I don't know what people, the, the panel feels, but I think there are very many differences between the telcos and the banks. And I think they, 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 they don't seem to agree from, 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 from what I've seen. And there seems to be a lot of mistrust between them. But at the same time, looking at the products that are in the market, I get a feeling that it is, we haven't gotten it right. It is like we have a solution looking for a problem. In the case of M-Pesa, it was very clear. There was a big need of money transfer. But at the moment, the products I've seen in the market, they're basically solutions looking for a problem. Uh, I don't know what you think. Perhaps we need to, to go back to the design stage. Thank you very much. So, um, yeah, thank you for your questions. There are a lot of questions. Can you okay. Okay. Yes, okay, so thank you for your questions again. Um, I, I, I think um, the program started uh, at least three, three years ago, three to four years ago in the Philippines. Um, and um, uh, you were talking about the criteria, the criteria. Um, actually, the health and education is not really the criteria. It's um, the conditions uh, that need to be developed, okay? But the criteria really is that um, uh, the, the selection, they're, they're selecting the, the uh, households which are below the poverty threshold in the Philippines, okay? And um, uh, it's only for households with um, a, ma a maximum of three children. So it can be a, um, a, so it can be a mother, father, and then one child, or at least three children. So that's, it's below the poverty threshold, okay? Um, what else is Sorry. Sorry. Uh, what? On, the, on the question about, uh, I think on the children, when uh, there are situations where in um, children are no longer qualified, or say the household um, apparently doesn't have uh, any more children to support to, uh, whether it is transferred or not. Um, I, I'm not really sure about the details on that. But we can we can probably check. Do, do, do you know that? Uh, I think um, I think they have like an, uh, uh, a system for checking and updating whether um, this uh, um, beneficiaries are still qualified. Okay, so if um, their children um, have um, reached the uh, age limit or have graduated in the program, so maybe uh, they they have uh, the disability has a way of checking it. Okay, and also um, they also have a way of um, assist, uh, they also have a system for those who have um, gone above the poverty threshold. So they they have a system for that. Okay. Uh, 
<laughs> for for the uh, uh, the EPM dispensing or not dispense or dispensing specific um, bills, um, there is no interest uh, acquired by the bank. So um, it's just that um, they get it um, less in in one time, and then in another time they get um, more than um, what they have, what they should be getting. Okay. And what else? Um, um, regarding regarding the change in penetration rate, uh, unfortunately, um, our, our study isn't really focused on, on that side. I mean, uh, during the qualitative research that we've done, um, there, there are signs that uh, indicate that there is, in, in fact, some positive change as to, for instance, consumption um, uh, resulting in um, higher enrollment rates or, or better performance in school, uh, better health conditions of, of the kids. But uh, it's, I wouldn't really say that it's definitive because that is not really the focus of, of our research. Um, what else? Okay. I, I'm going to then, um, we have one, th were there other pending responses? There, and I want to encourage, we'll encourage everyone if you have further conversations from your experiences to continue that in the breaks. Um, we had one question I do want to take that's from panelist to panelist, and so please, that will be the last one, and then we'll move on to the next, um, to the next panel. Um, actually, I just want to add something uh, after uh, 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 listening to the Ghana experience. In India also, we have very similar experience. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, we did another study, not IMTFS study, to understand um, why uh, the business correspondent model, the mobile money, is not getting so popular in India. And we interviewed, when we interviewed the agents, uh, the, the problems, whatever uh, our, my colleagues over there found, was very similar to what we found, like profit margin is very low for the uh, agents. Uh, and uh, agents are not being trained, uh, and they don't see the incentive of running this uh, product uh, for the poor. Um, so uh, at least in India, I just want to share that even though uh, the focus is on uh, like business using of business correspondent model for financing inclusion, the focus has been more on opening of bank accounts than the uses of uh, the accounts itself. So I think, uh, I don't know if it is the same problem in other countries, but I think the, finance, the definition of financial inclusion uh, probably has to be changed. Just opening bank accounts is probably not enough. Maybe you, how people should, if people are using or not, I think probably focus should be on more on uses of these bank accounts. Uh, and if something like that happened, then probably the uptake of uh, you know, mobile money might increase, uh, to, at least from India perspective. Unless is just opening of bank accounts. As long as people have bank accounts, people are financially included. If that is the principle, then I'm, I'm not sure if that will help in the long run. That's my statistics. Thank you. So with that, we will uh, wrap it up and thank our panelists and the audience for a great set of questions. And we'll move on to further discussion. Thank you. Wonderful. And thank you to um, Julia for facilitating that, that excellent panel. I wanted um, before the break to um, call up um, Cliff and Richard and company. Um, come on up. We um, are co-sponsoring a conference that's going to take place the 12th and 13th of March 2013 um, in Ghana together with the Ghana, Tele uh, the Ghana Technology University College on uh, mobile money uptake in Ghana. So I wanted these guys who are organizing it to just show their faces and say a couple words. Thank you very much, uh, Bill. Uh, yes, uh, I was going to call Abna. <laughs> now, uh, guys, we need your help. <laughs> How about that? Uh, you all have this, uh, uh, this uh, what do I call it, file, folder? All right, now flip open it and then see, right in there, you're going to find something that says um, mobile money payments in Ghana. You're going to see Ghana Technology University College and a call for papers. All right, now as I was listening to uh, Vivian and she was giving all those results, I could just see the visions in my eyes and what was actually happening in Ghana. 
And uh, I know the Kenyans are saying that they pity anybody who wants to follow them <laughs> or learn from them, but we need you at the table. Oh, Kenyans, where are you? Habari. <laughs> They're all looking away. Habari, <laughs> We need you at the table, Kenyans. We need the Indians at the table. We need our, our brothers our, and our sisters from Albania and Armenia and uh, Philippines. And, uh, <laughs> everywhere. Uh, in the United States and our friends on the internet, we need you. We need you to participate. Please, please show up. Send in your papers. We, we, we're still taking papers. Just imagine a scene, a scenario where you are presenting and discussing these ideas right in the presence of the telcos. Just imagine that. In the presence of the telcos. Telcos are present. Huh? Retailers are showing up. They're present. You have consumers, customers also present. Government regulators also present. We want to bring, we want to, we want to bring the relevant stakeholders all together for us to brainstorm. We want to keep this real and practical and then find real solutions uh, to, to these barriers that are impeding Ghanaians from adopting. And probably the lessons learned, the takeaways could be applicable to other countries as well. So please show up. Thank you so much for this time. Excellent. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Todd. Oh, and, uh, oh, there's a question. A question is a question. Uh, if you have questions, see me. See us. <laughs> Well, like I said in person, would like to learn from your experiences. You see opportunities that says that at the bottom it says propose us for a panel discussion. So you could come in with an idea for a panel discussion, actually giving us ideas about how you overcame your barriers, your difficulties, and uh, probably we might have some commonalities in the issues we're discussing. And uh, through the brainstorming, we could find solutions to these things. So although our call states a few guidelines, we are not restricting you. As long as you're in the business of financial inclusion, we need you at the table. Right. We need you at the table. Thank you so much. Thanks <laughs> Great. For your time. Yep. It's excellent. Thank you. Um, and the information on the call, I think, is also currently posted on the IMTFI website. And there's also copies of this flyer, extra copies, back in the back table. Um, I also wanted to just acknowledge that um, we have had a pretty phenomenal viewership of the live stream. There's been a, over 190 um, people logging in. Um, usually there's around 30 people at a time who are watching from all over the place. We've had greetings sent to us from um, Ayman in India and from Surimavan Kolambaji in Sri Lanka. And I know other past recipients of IMTFI um, awards have been listening in as well. So we just wanted to acknowledge them.